Right, so uh, very briefly here, we're just going to um, look at another phyla, um, which is also a diploblastic phyla with two true tissues. So they're going to have a, an epidermis And this is going to be the digestive cavity. All right, so this is going to be the mouth here. This is the gut here, lined by tissue called the gastrodermis. And it looks like uh, a, a bit like a scyphozoan sea jelly. People call it jellyfish. We said that that's wrong. Um, they're not fish. Uh, call them sea jellies. We refer to as scyphozoan jellies, the medusa form of the organism. And it looks like a medusa. Uh, but it's actually a completely different phyla of, or, of organism. And uh, these organisms tend to be seen a lot in uh, nature documentaries, in a variety of aquaria, and many people think they are cnidarians or a type of jellyfish, and they're, they're not. Or they're, they're something else, or their own phylum, their own group. Now, historically, there was a phyla uh, called, you can see the start, the start of this term here, um, called the solenterata. Right? And so this cavity here, which is the gut or stomach in this particular case, they actually have a little more differentiated um, cavity than the cnidarians do. All right. So this group is called the tenophora. So um, it's actually a silent T uh, in English pronunciation. So it's pronounced teen O four is sort of the tenophora or tenophora. Um, is the way that it's pronounced. Um, so these tenophores um, have eight comb rows. And so that's what the structure that we're referred to here is called a, a teen. Let me get a change of marker here. A teen is a comb row. And we'll get into the details of that. So what we're talking about here is a group that has maybe around 200 species um, known. Could vary. It could be less than that, and it's most likely, actually, most likely far more than that that have been undescribed um, so far. Um, these are marine organisms, so they're diploblastic. They are marine. They're primarily pelagic, although there are some uh, benthic uh, species that are known. Um, they look like a medusa. They are a clear, transparent organism that is diploblastic. They have a, a clear body, and they have a mesoglia. Um, so a jelly-like layer in between the two um, tissue layers. Between the epidermis and the gastrodermis is a mesoglia. They don't have a true um, third tissue layer that develops during embryonic development. And so the organism, and actually in terms of size, uh, some of them can be this large, actually in this particular drawing, kind of looking at here. Some can be larger than this, and then some can be very, very small. But the main characteristic they all have, one is they have the mouth all right, that leads into the gut. They have these eight, and it's always going to be eight, comb rows that are uh, in a radial pattern around the organism. So something we didn't quite talk about um, before with the cnidarians, uh, and that typically, I should do the polyp instead. Um, with the cnidarians, and we have our, say, polyp like this. All right. Typically, if you would cut that polyp in half in this direction, or you were to slice it in this direction, or you were to slice it in this direction, or you were to slice it in this direction, that the halves would be the same. And that is true for many of the cnidarian groups, but not necessarily all of them. Some of them have some variation to them. So when you can slice an organism into along any axis and that the two halves are exactly the same, that's called radial symmetry. Now, some organisms, um, when we look at the cnidarians and we look at the anthozoa, the anthozoa, their digestive tract is a little more developed, uh, somewhat like um, the tenophores here. Uh, and they have siphonoglyphs. So there's these little folds along a pharynx on the inside of the anthozoan. So in the individual polyps, instead of just like this just sac, there's more structure to it, right? And there's more detail. And there's two of them right down on the side. So 
generally they seem radially symmetrical, but if you look at some particular characteristic, they actually have a bilateral symmetry. So there's actually two true halves. And so typically we call that, and, and that's what this particular group is, they have the same kind of feature where generally they look radial. So any way you cut them, they look the same, except there's often some feature. So that feature could be like these two tentacles coming out here. Uh, if you sliced them at any angle, it wouldn't necessarily be exactly the same. You had to would have to keep them in account to put them into to two halves. But that would be like just one feature, not a whole variety of different features. So we call those, and this particular group uh, is referred to as being biradial, and that they generally have the radial symmetry characteristic. They look like a radially symmetrical organism, except um, there is some characteristic or feature that truly would separate them into two equal or even halves. So I have a, a sort of this in between. And bilaterals like us, we have, you know, there's only one plane you can get two equal halves. And even then it's not completely true, which in, it is in some cases, you know, our lungs, um, one in each half, kidneys, one in each half, but other things like the heart. We don't have two hearts. Um, we don't have two livers. So internally, we're not completely bilateral, but many of our features are, are, are bilaterally symmetrical. So that's just two halves and only one plane can separate them into two halves. Whereas radial is almost any plane can separate them into two equal halves and biradial is sort of the in-between. So a group of pelagic organisms that are sort of clear and transparent. They have a mesoglia, they are jelly-like, they look a lot like a scyphozoan jelly but they have these teen rows. So that's kind of what we'd focus in on. What, what are these things? Well, there's one of the only animals, an actually large multicellular animal that moves through ciliary action. So each of these structures here, maybe I'll try to grab the same colors so I'm not confusing you by drawing something different. So if we're to kind of zoom in here on a structure, not the gut, Okay, this, we're zooming in here on uh, one of those comb rows, okay? You're gonna have these little plates with cilia that look like, like a comb, like a hair comb, all right? That's kind of what they look like, but these are actual cilia on these little plates. And as the cilia move, they both move the organism. So they propel the organism through the water column. That's how they actually move. And in addition to that, um, they can help move food when food is captured. And we'll talk about that in a second. This is going to be um, a structure. So it's a small microscopic structure. It's not big like this. Um, so this is a microscopic in size uh, structure called a coloblast. So something else that separates them from the cnidarians. Cnidarians had a structure called a nidocyte that had the nematocyst, the stinging cell. We said that was a unique characteristic. No other group of living things has nematocysts. Now there are some organisms, um, types of snails, they're referred to generally as a kleptosnid. So they're an organism that can actually steal a characteristic or feature from another organism. And so these kleptosnids can actually uh, eat a cnidarian, take up their um, nematocyst, the, and not fire them off so they don't actually get triggered, bring them into their gut, move them into their own tissue, and now they have these stinging cells. And if an animal goes to try to eat that slug, they're stung with nematocysts from a cnidarian, even though they're eating the slug. Right? But the slug doesn't produce them. It's just kind of how some organisms have algae within them but they're, they're not a photosynthetic animal. They have a symbiosis. This is something slightly different, but cnidarians are the only thing that make and have the nematocysts. Tinophores don't have them. They do not have that structure, but they have something somewhat similar called a coloblast. Instead of stinging, it's sticky. So, these organisms are pelagic. They are mostly predators. Now keep in mind, when you think of a predator, you think of some organism, you know, maybe hunting down and killing some other organism. 
um, that's large, you know, in some cases. In this case, you know, just eat animal, eating another animal. Um, so this is an animal. They eat other animals. Usually they eat small microscopic animals. So they're eating copepods um, and, and the larvae of other marine invertebrates. Some of them uh, actually prey on other tenophores. And so there's um, a fairly well-known case where a certain group of tenophore was introduced into a marine ecosystem. It consumed a lot of the marine plankton in that area and it changed the whole environment right, in, a, in a very negative way. It had a very negative impact on the environment. A few years later, another species of tenophore was introduced from a different habitat, which doesn't belong in this particular area. However, that species ate the first species. And so now there was an invasive species of tenophore living there. However, because it only ate other tenophores and not all the microplanktonic animals that lived in that normal ecosystem, the ecosystem was actually able to go back to uh, and recover closer to the way it was before because of that predator then kept the other invasive species in check. And those two things were both tenophores. The one tenophore, they're both invasive, but the one was harming the ecosystem. The other didn't necessarily harm it um, because it actually uh, helped it return back to the way it was before. So they are typically predators. They catch things with tentacles that have these coloblasts. They then shoot out kind of like the nemesis, but then they stick to them. So they typically have a straight filament and a coiled filament like this. So they're kind of spring loaded and then they shoot out. Uh, they have all these granules. So these are sort of these sticky adhesive granules. granules um, and then they trap organisms bring them into their mouth where they then uh, digest them right, internally um, and then like I said they move and, and some smaller things they might catch and move around so they also display something that's very uh, interesting uh, and that most the, the overwhelming majority of tenophores produce a protein that reacts with calcium to produce light uh, and they are bioluminescent So they give off light that they produce themselves through a chemical reaction. Um, now, when people see, and if you look at a video of a tenophore swimming, what you're going to see are the movement of these little comb rows and the way that the cilia move reflects light. And so you're gonna see almost like a rainbow color effect um, from the movement of these teens. And it's very, very interesting to look at. And it's, it's, it's really fun to sort of watch them move around and watch these little teens moving. That is not the bioluminescence, okay? That is just refraction of light. Bioluminescence can only be seen in the dark and it usually gives off a blue or green light, all right? And that's again, because of calcium ions being released um, and it may attract other organisms to them in the dark so they could then capture them in the tentacles and then feed on them. So that's most that's most likely use uh, is is for that. And pot it's potentially something that could scare off other organisms as well, but it's most likely uh, from eating them. What eats them? Well, obviously, some, I said some other tenophores eat them, but you know, sea turtles eat them. There's some species of uh, pelagic fish, you know, that eat them, um, but not really a whole lot of, of other things that actually uh, eat uh, tenophores. So, um, so I think it's, on most of the main things, this isn't like a giant group of organisms. It's sort of just an extension a little bit or, or in relation to the cnidarians. Cnidarians are a major group of organisms. Like I said, they can create whole marine ecosystems with coral reefs. Uh, we have polyps and medusa. This group is is a technically, you know, it's, it's not exactly a medusa. It's sort of like this oval shaped organism, but because it is pelagic, it is medusa-like. They have no polyp form, right? So there are no polyps. The this Medusa free swimming pelagic form of the organism uh, is hermaphroditic. But in tenophores, they're almost always simultaneously hermaphroditic, meaning they're both male and female at the same time. And they also do something that is somewhat unique in that they uh, can self-fertilize themselves. So generally they're broadcast spawners. They release the sperm and eggs uh, out through the mouth um, and then into the water and then fertilization occurs in the water. The um, egg, fertilized egg then becomes a zygote and then becomes a little larval 
actinophore, and then it just kind of goes through a, a not a complete metamorphosis, but a, a just development essentially into a juvenile tinafore and, and it grows up. So they don't have a benthic stage that lives on the bottom. They're always pelagic. They're holopelagic, living their entire life uh, in the plankton. Um, it's kind of floating around. They, they have their own ability to swim, but they're generally at the mercy of the currents. So in other terms we'll get to later, to call, like plankton and nectin, what's the difference? Uh, essentially like fish generally would be called nectin in that they can, they're usually strong enough swimmers to swim against current. And if they stop swimming, they could be moved by the current. Technically, at that moment, they'd be called plankton because they're being moved by the current. But they have the ability to swim against the current. These organisms generally aren't that strong of a swimmer. So if there's a strong current, they're just going to be moved by the current. If the current isn't that strong, they move under their own ability. And in this case, it is ciliary movement that actually um, powers the entire organism to move to the water column. So they're very interesting marine organisms um, that uh, are... You know, they're not that well known in the sense that biologists don't understand a lot about them. We'd have, there's a lot of them that are not named, um, but because they're interesting, they're often found in shallow waters and deep waters, and uh, the way that they look make them related to a lot of the cnidarians. We see them a lot because in, in uh, aquaria and nature documentaries. So you very likely have seen a picture of one or a video of one before, and now you'll kind of know what it actually is.